Let us bow our heads just a moment for prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, it is indeed with privileges that we have of approaching Thee, our God and Savior. Hearing this marvelous song, How Great Thou Art, it thrills us because that we know that Thou art great. And we pray that your greatness will be manifested to us anew this afternoon as we speak. And it has fallen my lot for the first time in many years to try to go back into life's past. And I pray that you'll give me strength and, and, and what I need, Lord, to be in this hour. And may all my mistakes in life only be a stepping stone to others that would bring them closer to Thee. Grant it, Lord, may sinners see the footprints on the sands of time, and may they be led to Thee. These things we ask in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. I'll be glad. All right, sir. Thank you. As this sainted man, Brother Glover, that I've known now for some years, had the privilege of being with him a while last evening, and he told me of he'd been laid up for a little while resting, and now at 75 years old, is returning back into the service of the Lord. Ah, uh, not half as tired as I was before I heard that. I thought I was tired, but I don't believe I am. <laughs> he had just placed here to me some uh, handkerchiefs in the, the form of envelopes and so forth, where they're inside and already backed. Now, any of you in Radio Land are here that desires one of these handkerchiefs, and you would, uh, the Angelus Temple sends them out constantly, all the time. You could write right here to Angelus Temple, and they'll pray over it, because I will assure you that it's the Scripture. It's a promise of God. And if it would be that you'd want me to pray over one for you, why, I'd be glad to do that. You just would write me post office box. 325, 325, Jeffersonville, spelt J-E-F-F-E-R-S-O-N-V-I-L-L-E, Jeffersonville, Indiana. Or if you cannot think of the post office box, just write Jeffersonville. It's a small city, population about 35,000. Everyone knows me there. And so we would... Be glad to pray over a handkerchief and send to you. And now, we have had great success in doing this because you'll have a little form letter with it that people around the world pray every morning at 9 o'clock and at 12 o'clock and at 3 o'clock. And you can imagine around behind the world what time of the night they have to get up to make this prayer. So if all these... Tens of thousands and times thousands are sending prayers to God at that very same time for this ministry, your sickness. God just can't turn that away. And so, now, we, as I say, we don't have any programs. We're not wanting one penny of money. We're just, if we can help you, that's what we're here for. And let us, uh, someone is bringing another uh, bunch of handkerchiefs. Now, if you do not have a handkerchief that you wanted to send, well, then you just write anyhow. If you don't need it right now, keep it in the book of Acts in the Bible, the 19th chapter. And it'll be a form of a little white ribbon that will be set in instructions how to confess your sins first. And, uh, thank you. How to confess your sins you must never try to get anything from God without first being right with God. See? And then you're instructed in this to call your neighbors in and your pastor. 
you got anything it's in your heart against anyone, go make it right first. And come back and then pray, have a prayer meeting in your home and pin this handkerchief to your underneath garment, then believe God. And at that very three hours each day, there'll be people around the world praying, a chain around the world. And now it's yours absolutely free. Just send and, and now we will not be writing back to you to dun you or to tell you some program that we have. We want you to support program, but we don't, don't have any for you to support, see. So you, it's not to get your address. It's just merely uh, accommodation and a ministry of the Lord that we're trying to carry on. Now, let us bow our heads. And if you're in Radio Land, have your handkerchief laying there. Just put your own hand up on it while we pray. Gracious Lord, we bring to Thee these little parcels. Perhaps some of them look to be maybe a little vest for a baby or, or some little undershirt or maybe a little pair of booties or, or something, a handkerchief that's going to the sick and the afflicted. Lord, it is according to Thy Word that we do this. For we read in the book of Acts that they taken from the body of your servant, Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons, because they believed that your spirit was on the man. And unclean spirits went out of people, and afflictions and diseases left them, because they believed. And now we realize, Lord, that we're not St. Paul. But we know that you still remain Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. And we pray that you'll honor the faith of these people. And it was said once that when Israel, trying to obey God, had been caught into a trap, the sea before them, the mountains on either side, and Pharaoh's army approaching. And one has said that God looked down through that pillar of fire with angered eyes, and the sea got scared and rolled back itself and made a path for Israel to cross to the promised land. O oh Lord, look down again when these parcels are laid up on the sick bodies in commemoration of thy living word. And may the disease get scared. Yes. Look through the blood of thy son, Jesus, who died for this atonement. And may the enemy be scared and move away, that these people might move into the promise that above all things, that it is your desire that we prosper in health. Grant it, Father, for we send it with that, with that attitude in our heart. And that's our objective. We send it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Glover. Thank you, sir. Now, tonight being the closing of this part of the revival, I do not know whether it will be broadcast or not, but I'd like to say, if not to the radio audience, that this has been one of the finest meetings that I've had for many, many years. It's been solid sound, most loving, cooperative meeting that I have been in for a long time. We're on but, the air until quarter past four, brother, and they're listening to you all over Southern California, out into the islands and on the ships. We get messages from them, and so you got a big audience, thousands and tens of thousands. Thank you, sir. That's very good. Glad to hear that. God bless you all. And I certainly have a always had a warm place in my heart for the Angelus Temple for its stand for the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And now it's, it seems to be more personal to me now. It seems like after meeting everyone and seeing their fine spirit, I seem like I am just more one of you than I used to be. God bless you is my prayer. And... <laughs> Thank you kindly. Now, it was given out that today I was to 
kindly talk to you a while on my life story. That's a, a hard thing for me. This will be the first time I have tried to approach it for many years. And I would not have time to go in details, but just part of it. And in here I've made many mistakes, done many things that was wrong. And I desire that you in the radio land and you that are present, that you will not take my mistakes to be stumbling stones, but stepping stones to bring you closer to the Lord Jesus. Then tonight, the prayer cards is to be given out for the healing service tonight. Now, when we speak of healing service, doesn't mean that we're going to heal someone. We're going to pray for someone. God does the healing. He's just been very gracious to me to answer prayer. And I was talking to a, the manager of a famous evangelist here some time ago, and and it was asked, why didn't this evangelist pray for the sick? And the evangelist said back to the, the manager of my meetings, said, if this evangelist believes in divine healing, but if he would start praying for the sick, it would interrupt his service because he's sponsored by churches. Many churches and many of them does not believe in divine healing. So I have an honor and respect for the evangelist because he's keeping his place, his post of duty. He could perhaps, I could never take his place, and I doubt whether he could take my place. We all have a place in the kingdom of God. We're all jointed together, different gifts, but the same spirit. Different manifestations, I meant to say, but the same spirit. And now, tonight... The services will begin, I think they said the concert begins at uh, 6.30. And uh, if you're out in the radio land, come in to listen to this. It's, uh, it'll be beautiful, it's always. And then I uh, wish to say that the prayer cards will be given out immediately after this service. Just as soon as this service is dismissed, if you're here and want a prayer card, I was instructed in there just a few moments ago, my son, or Mr. Mercer, or Mr. Gold, they'll be giving out prayer cards. Just remain in your seat. As soon as the service is dismissed, just remain at your seat so the boys can get down through the line and get the prayer cards given out just as quick as possible. That'll be in the balcony, or on the floor, wherever, the bottom floors, or wherever you are. Just remain in your seat, and the boys will know that you're here for a prayer card. And... Uh, then tonight we'll be praying for the sick, and if the Lord does not change my thoughts, I want to preach on the subject tonight, if you'll show us the Father, it will satisfy us. Now, I wish to read for a, a text this afternoon, just to start off the life story, found over in the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter. And let's begin here about... I'd say about the twelfth verse. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let us go, therefore, to him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Now, that is kind of a text, for you see, if it's a life story or anything pertaining to a human being, we don't glorify that, and especially a, a man's past, if it's been as dark as mine has been. But I thought if we read the Scripture, God would bless the Scripture. And my thought is that here we have no continuing city. But we seek one to come. Now, I know that you're very fond of Los Angeles. You have a right to be. It's a great, beautiful city with its smog and what more. Yet it's a beautiful city. Fine climate. 
But this city cannot continue. It's got to have an end. I've stood in Rome where the great emperors and the cities that they thought they would build in mortal and dig down 20 feet to even find the ruins of it. I've stood where the pharaohs has had their great kingdoms and you'd dig down in the ground to find where the great pharaohs ruled. All of us like to think about our city and our place, but remember, it cannot stand. When I was a little boy, I used to go to a great maple tree in my country. We have a lot of hardwood. And then we had this maple trees, the sugar maple, and what we call the hard maple and soft maple. This great gigantic tree, it was the most beautiful tree. When I would come in from the fields of working the hay and, and the harvests, I would love to go to this big tree and, and sit down under it and, and look up. And I'd see its great, mighty uh, uh, branches sway in the wind, great, huge trunk. And I said, you know, I believe that this tree will be here for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Not long ago, I took a look at the old tree. It's just a snag. For here we have no continuing city. No, nothing here on the earth that you can look at will continue. It's got to have an end. Everything that's mortal has to give away to an immortality. So no matter how good we build our highways, how fine we make our structures, it all has to go. For here there's nothing can continue. Just the unseen is what continues. I remember the house that we lived in. It was an old log house chinked with mud. I, uh, perhaps maybe many never s seen a house chinked with mud. But it was all chinked up with mud and the great huge logs that was in the old house. I thought that house would stand for hundreds of years. But you know, today where that house stood is a housing project. It's so much different. Everything's changing. But now I used to see my father. He was a rather a short, stocky man, very strong. And he was one of the strongest little men that I knew of. I met Mr. Coots, a fellow that he used to work with in the logs. He was a logger. And about a year ago, and Mr. Coots is a very good friend of mine, a deacon in the First Baptist Church. And he said, Billy, you ought to be a real powerful man. And I said, no, I'm not, Mr. Coots. He said, if you took after your daddy, you would be. He said, I seen that man weighing 140 pounds, load a log on the wagon by himself. It weighed 900 pounds. He just knew how to do it. He was strong. I'd seen him come into the place to wash and get ready for dinner when mother would call him. And we had an old apple tree out in the front yard. And then there was three or four small ones along towards the back. And right in the middle tree, there was an old looking glass that had been broke, Mara, large one, and had been tacked on the side of the tree with some nails bent in. Kind of like what some of you carpenters listening in would call coat hangers. It had been bent in to hold the glass in its place. There was an old tin comb. How many ever seen an old tin, the old-fashioned tin comb? I can just see it. And then there was a little wash bench, just a little board with a little slanting leg beneath it tacked against the tree. A little old half sulfur pump there that we pumped the water out and we washed at this old tree. And Mama used to take meal sacks and make towels. Anybody ever use a meal sack towel? Well, I'm sure I feel at home now. And those big old rough towels, and when she'd give us little kitties a bath, she'd feel like she's rubbing the hide off every time she rubbed. And I... 
Remember that old meal sack and she'd pull some of the strings out and make little tassels to kind of decorate it up. How many ever slept on a straw tick? Well, I will say it. How many ever know what a shuck pillow was? Well, Brother Glover, I'm at home now, sure enough. Mm-hmm. Straw tick? Well, it hasn't been too long since I just come off of one. And it was a... Oh, it's good sleeping. Cool. Then in the wintertime, they take the old feather bed and lay on it, you know, and then have to put a piece of canvas over the top of it because the snow blowed in the, the, uh, the cracks in the house, you know, where the old clapboard shingles would turn up, you know, and the snow would sweep through it. And, oh, I can remember that very well. And then Pop used to have a shaving brush. Ah, now this is going to get you. It was made out of corn shucks. A shaving brush with corn shucks. He'd take mother's old lye soap that she had made, fix it up and put it on his face with this corn shuck brush and shave it with a big old straight razor. And on Sunday, he'd take the, um, the pieces of paper, stick around his collar, the wore celluloid collars, and put it around the collar like this to keep the, the, the lather from getting on his shirt collar. Did you ever see that done? Why, my, my. I remember a little old spring down below where we used to go get a drink a water and get our water out of an old gourd dipper. How many ever seen a gourd dipper? Well, how many of you is from Kentucky anyhow? <laughs> well, just look at here at the Kentuckians. Well, my, I'm, I'm right at, I thought it was all Okies and Arkies out here. But it looked like Kentucky's moving in. Well, they did strike oil in Kentucky a few months ago, you know, so maybe that's, some of them's coming this way. And then I remember when Dad used to come in and take his wash for dinner, and he'd roll up his sleeves, them little short, stubby arms. And when he'd pull up his arms to wash, throw the water up on his face, the muscle just wadded in his little arms. And I said, you know, my daddy will live to be 150 years old. He was so strong, but he died at 52. See? Here we have no continuing city. That's right. We cannot continue. Now let's take a little trip, all of us. There's every one of you here that has a life story, just as I do. And it's good to stroll down memory's lane once in a while. Don't you think so? Just go back and let's all go back for a while. Back to similar experiences as a a little children. And now the first part of the life story, I'll just give it a little touch because it's in the book and many of you have the book. I was born in a little mountain cabin way up in the mountains of Kentucky. They had one room that we lived in, no rug on the floor, not even wood on the floor. It was just simply a bare floor and a stump top of a stump cut off with three legs on it. That was our table. And all those little Branhams would pile around there and out on the front of the little old cabin and waller down. looked like where a bunch of possums had been wallering. Out there in the dust, you know, all the little brothers, it was nine of us. And one little girl, and she really had a rough time amongst that bunch of boys. We have to respect her yet today from the things that we did in those days. She couldn't go with us anywhere. We'd run her back. She's a girl. So she couldn't take it, you know. So we had, and all, remember that back behind the table, uh, we had just two chairs. And they were made out of limb bark, just old hickory uh, saplings put together and the bottom of them laced with hickory bark. Did anybody ever see a hickory bark chair? Yeah. And I can hear Mama yet all later on when we got into a place where she could have a wooden floor with those babies on her lap like this and rocking that old chair just bang, diddy, bang, diddy, bang on the floor. I remember to keep the little ones from going out the door when she would be washing or something, she'd lay a chair down and turn it kind of catacornered across the door to keep the little ones from getting out when she had to go to spring to get water and so forth. 
And mother was 15 years old when I was born. Dad was 18. And I was the first of the nine children. And they told me that the morning I was born, now we was very poor, just the poorest of poor. And we did not even have a window in this little cabin. It had like a little wooden door that you open. I doubt whether you ever seen anything like that. A little wooden door that opened instead of a window. You keep it open in the daytime, you closed it at night. We couldn't turn on the electric lights or even burn kerosene in those days. We had what you call a grease lamp. I don't know whether you ever know what a grease lamp was. Well, what do you... And did you ever buy, burn a pine knot for... Just take a pine knot and light it and lay it up on a lid? It'll burn. And that's smoked up a little bit, but they had no French or anyhow to smoke up, so it just... The cabin got the smoking. It drawed good because there's plenty of roof up there for it to draw through. So it... Um, and I was born on... April the, the 6th, 1909. Of course, you know that makes me a little over 25 now. And so, uh, the morning that I was born, Mother said that uh, they opened up the window. Now, we had no doctors. It was a midwife. Just And that midwife was my grandmother. And so, when I was born in my first beginning to cry, and, and mother wanted to see her child, and, and she's no more than a child herself. And when they opened up the little window just at the break of day, about five o'clock, and the, there was an old robin setting by the side of a little bush, as you all seen the picture of it in, in my book of my life story. An old robin was sitting there just singing for all that was in him. I've always loved robins. Now, you boys out in Radio Land, don't shoot at my birds. You see, they're, 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 they're my birds. Did you ever hear the legend of the robin, how he got his red breast? I'll stop here a moment. How he got his red breast? There was a king of kings was dying one day on a cross. And he was suffering and no one would come to him. He had no one to help him. And there was a little brown bird wanting to take them nails out of the cross. And he kept flying into the cross and jerking on those nails. He was too little to pull them out. And he got his little breast all red with blood. And ever since then, his breast has been red. Don't shoot him, boys. Let him alone. He was sitting at the side of the window, a chirping as the robins sing, and, and Dad pushed back the window, and when they pushed the little window door back, that light that you see in the picture come whirling in the window, says my mother, and hung over the bed. Grandmother didn't know what to say. Now, we are was not a religious family. My people are Catholic. I'm Irish on both sides. My father is strictly Irish, Branham. My mother is Harvey, only her father married a Cherokee Indian. So that broke the little line of the blood of the Irish. And father and mother did not go to church, and they married out of the church. And they had no religion at all. And back there in the mountains, there was not even a Catholic church. So they come over in the early settlers. Two Branhams come over, and from that sprung the whole generation of Branhams as the genealogy of the family. And then she opened, when they opened this window and this light stood in there, they did not know what to do. Dad had bought him, Mama said, a new pair of overhauls for this event. He's standing with the, his arms in the bib of the old overhauls like the woodsmen and loggers used in those days. And it frightened them. Well, after I'd got up maybe ten days old or something, they'd taken me up to a little Baptist church called Possum Kingdom. Possum Kingdom Baptist Church. That's quite a name. There's an old circuit 
preacher, the old-fashioned Baptist preacher, came through there about once every two months. On uh, The people would have a little uh, service together. They'd go sing some songs, but they had preaching ever so often on the circuit rider. They paid him each year with a sack of pumpkins and a few things like that, you know, that the people would raise to give him. And the old preacher came by, and there he offered prayer for me as a little boy. That was my first trip to church. At the year of about something a little over two years old, the first vision taking place. Well, they had told around in the mountains there that this light came in. So they tried to figure it up. Some of them said it must have been the sunlight reflecting on a mirror in the house, but there was no mirror in there and the sun wasn't up. So it was too early at five o'clock. And then, oh, they just passed it by. And when it's about, uh, supposed to be near three years old, now I have to be honest. There's things here that I do not like to say. And I wish I could bypass it and not have to say it, but yet, to tell the truth, you must tell the truth. If it's on yourself or your people, be honest about it, then it's always the same. My father was a long way from being a religious person. He was a typical mountain boy that drank constantly all the time. And he had gotten in some trouble in a fight. And there had been two or three men almost killed as a fighting, shooting, and cutting one another with knives at a, some kind of a party up in the mountains. And Dad had been one of the ringleaders of this fight because it had been a friend of his that got hurt and had hit someone with a chair and had, the man had a knife out and was going to cut Dad's friend on the floor with this knife through his heart. And Dad took his part. And it really must have been a terrible fight because they, from all the way down to Burksville, many miles away, they sent a sheriff up after Dad, horseback. So the man was laying at the point of death. Might be some of his people listening in. I'm going to call his name. Will Yarberry was his name. It probably, I think, some of them is in California of his boys. But he was a bully, great, powerful man, killed his own boy with a fence rail. So he, he was a very powerful and wicked man. And so there was a great knife fight between he and dad, and my father almost killed the man. So he had to run and leave Kentucky and come across the river to Indiana. And um, he had a brother that lived at the time in Louisville, Kentucky. It was the assistant superintendent of the Wood Mosaic Sawmills in Kentucky and Louisville. And so dad come to find his older brother. Dad was the youngest of the boys of 17 children. And so he came to find his older brother. And while he was gone for almost a year, he could not come back because the law was looking for him. And then when we had heard from him by letter, signed by another name, but that he had told mother how it would be that she'd hear from him. And then I remember one day, the spring, this little cabin was just behind the house. And, and during that time, after there's nine, eleven months difference between me and my next brother. And he was still crawling and I had a big rock in my hand and I was trying to show him how hard I could throw this rock in the old mud where the spring had run out of the ground and made the muddy ground. And I heard a bird and it was singing up in a tree and I looked up to that tree and the bird flew away and when it did a voice spoke to me I know you think I could not think and remember that but the Lord God who judged the earth and the heavens and all there is knows that I'm telling the truth that bird when it flew away a voice came from where the bird was in the tree, like a wind caught in the bush, and it said, you'll live near a city called New Albany. And I've lived from the time I was three years old until this time within three miles of New Albany, Indiana. I went in and told my mother about it, 
Well, she thought I was just dreaming or something. Later, we moved to Indiana, and Father went to work for a man, Mr. Wathen, a rich man. He owns the Wathen distilleries, and he owned a great shears. He's a malted millionaire, and the Louisville colonels and, and baseball and so forth. And then we lived near there, and Dad, being a poor man, yet he could not do without his drinking, so he, he went to making whiskey in a, in a still. And then it worked a hardship on me because I was the oldest of the children. I had to come and pack water to this still to keep those coils cool while they were making the whiskey. Then he got to selling it, and then he got two or three of those stills. Now, that's the part I don't like to tell, but it's the truth. And I remember one day from the barn coming up to the house crying because out at the back of the place was a pond it, where they used to cut ice. Many of you remember when they used to cut ice and put it in sawdust? Well, that's the way Mr. Wathen kept ice out there in the country. And Father was a, a chauffeur for him, a private chauffeur. And when uh, this pond was full of fish, and when they would go to cutting the ice and bring it in and put it in the sawdust, and when the ice melted in the summertime, uh, as it went down, it was kind of clean, I suppose, more like a lake ice, and they could use it not to drink, but to keep water cold, put it around the buckets and their milk and so forth. And one day, packing water from back out at this pump, which was about a city block, I was squalling to who wouldn't have it, because I'd come from school and all the boys went out to the pond fishing. I just loved to fish. And so they... Uh, all got to go fishing but me, and I had to pack water for this still. Of course, my, that had to be mum as prohibition. And um, I, it was such a hardship. And I remember coming along there with a stump toe. I had a corn cob wrapped under my toe to keep it out of the dust. Did you ever do that? Just put a corn cob under your toe like this and wrap a string around it. It holds your toe right up like a turtle head almost, you know, sticking up. You could track me everywhere I went with this corn cob under my toe where it stump it, you know. I didn't have any shoes to wear, so we never wore shoes sometime half the winter. And if we did, we, it was just what we could pick up somebody would give us and clothes to what somebody charity would give us. And I stopped under this tree. And I was sitting there just squalling. It was in September. Because I wanted to go fishing, I had to pack several tubs of water with little molasses buckets. Just about that high, half a gallon, because it's just a little lad of about seven years old. And I'd pour them in a big tub and then go back and get a, another two buckets and come back pumping it. That's the water we had. And there's going to run off a batch of that corn whiskey that night. These men with Daddy up at the house. And I was crying, and all at once I heard something making a noise, like a whirlwind, something like this. Now, I hope it isn't too loud, going, just a noise like that. Well, it was awful quiet. And I looked around, and you know what a little whirlwind, I believe you call them little cyclones in the fall of the year. They pick up through the cornfield, you know, the leaves and so forth. In the autumn there, the leaves had just begun turning, and I was under a great white poplar tree that stood about halfway between the barn and the, the house. And I heard that noise, and I looked around. It's just as quiet as it is in this room. Not a leaf blowing nowhere, nothing. And I thought, where's that noise coming from? Well, I thought, must be away from here, just a lad. And it got louder and louder. I picked up my little buckets and squalled a couple more times and started up the lane. I was resting. And I got just a few feet from that, out from under the branches of this big tree. And oh my, it made a whirl sounding. And I turned to look, and about halfway up that tree was another whirlwind caught in that tree, just going around and around, moving those leaves. Well, I thought nothing strange about that because it just, in that time of year, and the uh, autumn, why those whirlwinds come? Little, we call them whirlwinds, and they uh, and they pick up dust. You see them on the desert like that. Same thing. So I watched, but it didn't leave off. Usually, it's just a puff for a moment, and then it goes. But it had already been in there two minutes or more. 
Well, I started up the lane again and I turned to look at this again. And when it did, a human voice, just as audible as mine is, said, Don't you never drink, smoke, or defile your body in any way. There will be a work for you to do when you get older. Why, it like to scared me to death. You can imagine how a little fella felt. I dropped those buckets and home I went just as hard as I could go, screaming the top of my voice, and there was copperheads in that country, snakes, and they're very poison. Mother thought, coming alongside the garden, I'd perhaps got my foot on a copperhead, and she ran to meet me, and I jumped up in her arms, screaming, hugging her, and kissing her, and she said, what's the matter? Did you get snake bit? Look me all over. I said, no, Mama, there's a man in that tree down there. And she said, oh, Billy, Billy, come on. And she said, did you stop and go to sleep? I said, no, ma'am. There's a man in that tree and he told me not to drink and not to smoke. Drink whiskeys and and things. And I was packing water to a moonshine still right there. And he said, don't you never drink or defile your body in any way. That's immoral, you know, and my child, young manhood with women. And to my best, I have never one time been guilty of such. The Lord help me with those things, and as you go along, you'll find out. So then, don't drink, or don't smoke, or do not defile your body, for there will be a work for you to do when you get older. Well, I told that to Mama, and she just laughed at me, and I was just hysterically. She called the doctor, and the doctor said, well, he's just nervous, that's all. So she put me to bed, and I never from that day to this ever passed by that tree again. I was scared. I'd go down the other side of the garden because I thought there was a man up in that tree. And he was talking to me. Great, deep voice that spoke. And uh, then sometime about a month after that, I was playing marvels out with my little brothers out in the front yard. And all at once I had a strange feeling come on me. And I stopped and sat down on the side of the tree and we were right up on the bank from the Ohio River. And I looked down towards Jeffersonville, and I seen a bridge rise up and go across the, uh, the river, span the river, and I seen 16 men, I count them, had dropped off of there and lost their lives on that bridge. I run in real quick and told my mother, and she thought I went to sleep, but they kept it in mind. And 22 years, the man, the municipal bridge, now it's many of you cross when you cross there. Crossed the river at the same place and 16 men lost their life building that bridge across the river. It's never failed to be perfectly true. As you see it here in the auditorium, it's been that way all the time. Now, they thought I was just a nervous, which I am a nervous person. That's true. And if you ever notice, people who are, are inclined to be spiritual are nervous. Look at poets and prophets and look at... William Keffer, who wrote uh, that famous song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Did you ever, you know the song. I stood by his grave not long ago. Brother Julius, I believe. Oh, no, no, uh, yes, that's right. was with us over there. And his grave. And and there, after he had wrote that song, the inspiration left him. He tried to find uh, the, the river to commit suicide. See, the spirit had left him. And people like... uh, uh, Poets and authors, and are not, uh, I mean, prophets. Look at Elijah. When he stood on the mountain and called fire out of the heaven and called rain out of the heaven, then when the Spirit left him, he ran at a threat of a woman, and God found him pulled back in a cave 40 days later. Look at Jonah with enough inspiration when the Lord had anointed him to preach there in Nineveh to a, a city with the size of St. Louis, repented with sackcloth. And then when the Spirit left him, what happened to him? We find him up on the mountain after the Spirit left him, praying to God to take his life. And uh, you see, it's inspiration. And when these things happen, it, it does something to you. Then I remember coming on up, I got to be a young man. I'll hurry to make it within the next little bit. When I uh, got to be a young man, I had ideas like all young men. Uh, going to school, I found them little girls. You know, I was real bashful. You know, and I, I finally got me a little girlfriend. And uh, like all little boys, about 15 years old, I guess. And, and so, uh, oh, she was pretty. 
My, she had eyes like a dove, and she had teeth like pearl, and a neck like a swan, and she, she was really pretty. And another little boy, he, uh, we were buddies, so he got his daddy's old Model T Ford, and we got a date with our girls, and we was going to take them out riding. We got enough, about two gallons of gasoline, we had to jack the back wheel up to crank it. I don't know whether you ever remember that or not, you know, to crank it, but we, we was going along pretty good. And so I had a few nickels in my pocket, and we stopped at a little place and got, you could get a ham sandwich for a nickel. And so, oh, I was rich. I could buy four of them, see. And after we'd eat the sandwiches and drink the Coke, I started taking the bottles back. And to my surprise, when I come out, women had just start falling from grace at that time, for our, from womanhood. My little dove was smoking a cigarette. Well, I've always had my opinion of a woman that would smoke a cigarette, and I haven't changed it one bit from that time on. That's right. It's the lowest thing she can do. And that's exactly right. And I, well, I, now the cigarette company could get after me for this, but I'm telling you that's just a stunt of the devil. It's the biggest killer and sabotage this nation's got. I'd rather my boy be a drunkard than to be a cigarette smoker. That's the truth. I'd rather see my wife laying on the floor drunk than to see her with a cigarette. That's how... Now, if this Spirit of God that's with me, if that is the Spirit of God, as you might question, you smoking cigarettes has got a slim chance when you get there. Because that just... Every time you notice it on the platform how he condemns it, it's a horrible thing. Keep away from it. Ladies, if you have been guilty of that, please, in the name of Christ, get away from it. It breaks you. It'll kill you. It, it's, a, it's a cancer by the carloads. The doctors try to warn you. And then how they can sell you that stuff. If you go down to the drugstore and say, buy, I want to buy 50 cents worth of cancer. while well, they come lock them up. But when you buy 50 cents worth of cigarettes, you're buying the same thing. Doctors say so. Oh, this money mad nation. It's too bad. It's a killer. It's been proved. Well, when I seen that pretty little girl just acting smart, this cigarette in her uh, hand, that liked to kill me because I really thought I loved her. And I thought, well, I'm called a woman hater. You know that because I'm always kind of against women, but not against you sisters. I'm just against the way modern women act. That's right. Well, good women should be packed long, but I can remember when my father's still up there running. I had to be out there to, with water and stuff. I see young ladies that wasn't over 17, 18 years old up there with man my age now, drunk, and they'd have to sober them up and give them black coffee to get home to cook their husband's supper. Oh, something like that. I said, I, this was my remark then. They're not worth a good, clean bullet to kill them with it. That's right. And I hated women. That's right. And I just have to watch every move now to keep them still thinking the same thing. So, but now a good woman is a jewel in a man's crown. She should be honored. She's, my mother's a woman. My wife is. And they're lovely. And I've got thousands of Christian sisters who I highly respect. But if, if they can respect what God made them, a motherhood and a real queen, that's all right. She's one of the best things that God could give a man was a wife. Besides salvation, a wife is the best thing if she is a good wife. But if she isn't, Solomon said, a good woman is a jewel in a man's crown, but a, a honorary one or no good one is water in his blood. And that's, that's the worst thing that could happen. So a good woman, if you've got a good wife, brother, you ought to respect her with the highest. That's right. You should do that. A real woman. And children, if you've got a real mother that stays home and tries to take care of you, keeping your clothes clean, sends you to school, teaching you about Jesus, you should honor that sweet old mother with all that's in you. You should respect that woman. Yes, sir, because she's a real mother. They talk about the illiteracy of Kentucky mountains. You sit in this here dog patch stuff. Some of them old mammies out there could come here to Hollywood and teach you modern mothers how to raise your kids. You let her kid come in one night with her hair all messed up and lips, slips, what do you call it? Makeup stuff they put on her face and her dress all squeezed to one side and been out all night drunk. 
Brother, she'd get one of the limbs off the top of that hickory tree and she'd never go out no more. I'm telling you, she'd, and if you had a little more of that, you'd have a better Hollywood around here and a better nation. That's right. It's true. Just try to be modern. That's one of the tricks of the devil. Now, this little girl, when I looked at her, my heart just bled. And I thought, poor little fella. And she said, oh, you want a cigarette, Billy? I said, no, ma'am. I said, uh, I don't smoke. She said, now, you said you didn't dance. They want to go to a dance, and I wouldn't do it. So I said, there's a dance down there, what's called Sycamore Gardens. And I said, no, I don't dance. She said, now, you don't dance, you don't smoke, you don't drink. How do you have any fun? I said, well, I like to fish. I like to hunt. That didn't interest her. <laughs> so she said, take this cigarette. And I said, no, ma'am, thank you. I don't smoke. And um, I was standing on the fender. They had a running board on the old forge, you remember. I was standing on that fender, sitting in the back seat, she and I. And she said, you mean you won't smoke a cigarette? said, and we girls has got more nerve than you have. I said, no, ma'am, don't believe I want to do it. She said, well, you big sissy. Oh, my. I wanted to be Big Bad Bill, so I I sure didn't want nothing sissy. See, I wanted to be a prize fighter. That was my uh, idea of life. So um, I said, uh, sissy, sissy. I couldn't stand that. So I said, give it to me. I handed out, I said, I'll show you where I'm sissy or not. Got that cigarette out and started to strike the match. Now, I know you're, now, I'm not responsible for what you think. I'm just responsible for telling the truth. When I started to strike that cigarette, just as much determined to smoke it as I am to pick up this Bible, see, I heard something going. I tried again. I couldn't get it to my mouth. I got to crying. I threw the thing down. They got to laughing at me. And I walked home. Went up to the fields, sat down out there crying and and it was a terrible life. I remember one day Dad was going down the river. The boys, my brother and I, we had to take a boat and go up and down the river hunting bottles to put the whiskey in. We got a nickel, a dozen for them to pick them up along the river. And Dad was with me and he had one of these little flat, I believe it was about a half pint bottles. And there's a tree had blown down and Dad and this man was with him, Mr. Darnbush. I had his, he had a nice boat and I wanted to find favor with him because I wanted to use that boat. It had a good rudder. Mine didn't have no rudder at all. We had this old boards to paddle with. And if he'd let me use that boat, so he done welding and he made the stills for Dad. So uh, he, they throw their leg up across that tree and Dad reached in his back pocket and pulled out a little flat bottle of whiskey, handed it to him and he took a drink, handed it back to Dad and he'd take a drink. And he set it down on a little sucker on the side of the tree that went out. And Mr. Darnbush picked it up and said, Here you are, Billy. I said, Thank you. I don't drink. He said, A Branham? And don't drink? Everyone died with their boots on, nearly. And he said, A Branham and don't drink? I said, No, sir. No, Dad said, I raised one sissy. <clears throat> My daddy calling me a sissy. I said, Hand me that bottle. And I pulled that stopper out of the top of it, determined to drink it. And when I started to turn it up, I hand the bottle back and took off down through the field as hard as I could, crying. Something wouldn't let me do it. See, I could not say well, I was any good. I was determined to do it. But it's God, grace, amazing grace that kept me from doing those things. I wanted to do them myself, but He just wouldn't let me do it. Later on, I found a girl when I was about 22 years old. She was a darling. She was a girl that went to church, German Lutheran. Her name was Brombach, B-R-U-M-B-A-C-H, come from the name of Brombach. And she was a nice girl. She didn't smoke or drink or or she didn't uh, dance or anything. A nice girl. I went with her for a little while and I... Then, about 22, I'd made enough money to, I bought me an old Ford. And uh, I, we'd go out on dates together. And so, that time, there was no Lutheran church close. They'd moved from Howard Park up there. And so, there was a minister, the one that ordained me in the Missionary Baptist Church, Dr. Roy Davis, Sister Upshaw, the very one that sent the Brother Upshaw over to me or talked to him about me, Dr. Roy Davis. 
And um, so he was preaching and had the First Baptist Church or the, uh, the uh, I don't believe it was the First Baptist Church either. It was a mis- called the Missionary Baptist Church at Jeffersonville. And he was preaching at the place at that time and we would go to church at night. So, and we'd come back and I never did join church, but I just liked to go with her because the main thought was going with her. I just might as well be honest. So then, uh, going with her. And one day, I, she is out of a nice family. And I begin to think, you know, you know, I oughtn't take that girl's time. It isn't, it isn't right. Because she's a nice girl. And I'm poor. And, and I, my daddy had broke down in health. And I, I, there was no way for me to make a living for a girl like that who had been used to a nice home and rugs on the floor. I remember the first rug I ever seen. I didn't know what it was. I walked around the side. I thought it was the prettiest thing I ever seen in my life. How would they put something like that on the floor? It was the first rug I'd ever seen. It was this one of these, I believe it's called matting rugs. I may have had that wrong. Some guy like wicker or something is laced together and laying on the floor, pretty green and red and big rolls worked in the middle of it. You know, it was a pretty thing. And so, um, I remember uh, I made up my mind that I either had to ask her to marry me or I must get away and let some good man marry her. Somebody that would be good to her, could make her a living and could be kind to her. I could be kind to her, but I, I, I was only making 20 cents an hour. So I couldn't make too much of a living for her. And I, with all the family we had to take care of and dad broke down in health and I had to take care of all them. So... I was having a pretty rough time. So I thought, well, uh, the only thing for me to do is tell her that I, I, she, I, I just won't be back because I thought too much of her to wreck her life and to let her fool along with me. And then I thought if somebody could get a hold of her and marry her, make a lovely home, and maybe if I couldn't have her, I could, I could know that she was happy. And so I thought, but I, I just... I just can't give her up. And I, I was in an awful shape. And day after day, I'd think about it. So I was too bashful to ask her to marry me. Every night, I'd make up my mind, I'm going to ask her. And I, uh, what is that, butterflies or something? Get in your... Uh, all you brethren out there probably had the same experience along that. And a real funny feeling. My face would get hot. Uh, I didn't know. I couldn't ask her. So I guess you wonder how I ever got married. You know what? I wrote her a letter and asked her. <laughs> and so, er, now it wasn't dear miss. It was a little more, you know, on the love side than that. It was just not a, an agreement. It was, I, I wrote it up best I could. And I was a little afraid of her mother. Her mother was, she was kind of rough. And, uh, but her father was a gentle old Dutchman, just a fine old fella. He was a uh, organizer of the Brotherhood of the Trainmen on the railroad, making about $500 a month. And them times of me making 20 cents an hour to marry his daughter. Mm. I know that would never work. And her mother was very, now she's a nice lady. And she, uh, she was kind of one of these high societies, you know, and prissy like, you know. And so she didn't have much use for me anyhow. I was just an old plain sassafras country boy. And she thought Hope ought to go with a little better class of boy, and I, I, I think she was right. And so, um, but I, I didn't think it then. So I thought, well, I don't know, how, I can't ask her daddy, and I, I'm sure I'm not going to ask her mother. And so I've got to ask her first. So I wrote me a letter that morning on the road to work. I dropped it in the mailbox. The mail was going to church Wednesday night, and that was on Monday morning. I tried all day Sunday to tell her that I wanted to get married, and I just couldn't get up enough nerve. So then I dropped it in the mailbox, and all it worked that day, I happened to think, what if her mother got a hold of that letter? Oh, my. Then I know I was ruined if, if she ever got a hold of it. Because she didn't care too much about me. Well, I was just sweating it out. And that Wednesday night when I come, oh my, I thought, how am I going to go up there? If her mother got a hold of that letter, she'll really work me over. So I hope she got it. I dressed it to Hope. That was her name, Hope. And so I said, I'll just write it out here to Hope. And so and I thought maybe she might have not have got a hold of it. So I don't better to stop outside and blow the horn for her to come out. Oh my. 
And any boy that hasn't got nerve enough to walk up to the house and knock on the door and ask for the girl ain't got no business being out with her anyhow. That's exactly right. That's so silly. That's cheap. And so I stopped my old Ford, you know, and I had it all shined up. And so I went up and knocked at the door. <laughs> Mercy, your mother come to the door. I couldn't hardly catch her. I said, uh, how, how do you do, Miss Brumman? <laughs> she said, how do you do, William? I said, oh, William. And, uh, and she said, will you step in? I said, thank you. I stepped inside the door. I said, is uh, uh, Hope just about ready? <laughs> and just then, here come Hope skipping through the house. Just a girl at 16. And uh, she said, hi, Billy. And I said, hi, Hope. And I said, you about ready for church? She said, just in a minute. And I thought, oh, my. She never got it. She never got it. Good, good, good. <laughs> Hope never got it either, so it'll be all right, because she'd have named it to me. So I felt pretty fair. And then when I got out of church... I happened to think, what if she did get it? See? I couldn't hear what Dr. Davis was saying. I look over at her and I thought, if maybe she's just holding it back and she's really going to tell me off when I get out of here for asking her that. And I couldn't hear what Brother Davis was saying. Uh, and I look over at her and I thought, my, I hate to give her up. But and I, I, the showdown's sure to come. So after church, we started walking down the street together, going home and... and um, so we walked to the old Ford, and it's all along, the moon is shining bright, and I look over, and she's pretty, boy, I look at her, I thought, my, how I would like to have her, but guess I can't. And so I walked on a little further, you know, and I look up at her again, I said, hi, how are you feeling tonight? She said, oh, I'm all right. And we stopped the old Ford down, and we start to get out, you know, around the side, walk around the corner, go to her house, and I was walking up to the door with her. I thought, you know, she probably uh, never got the letter, so I just might as well forget it. I'll have another week of grace anyhow. So I got feeling pretty good. She said, uh, Billy? I said, yeah. She said, uh, <clears throat> I got your letter. Oh, my. I said, you did? She said, uh-huh. Well, she just kept walking up. I never said another word. I thought, woman, tell me something. Run me away or tell me what you think about it. I said, um, did, you, uh, <clears throat> did you read it? She said, uh-huh. <laughs> My, you know how a woman can keep you in suspense? Oh, I, I didn't mean it that way, you see, you see. But anyhow, you know, I, I thought, why don't you say something? See, and I kept going on. I said, did you read it all? Uh-huh. So he's almost to the door. And I thought, boy, don't get me on the porch because I might not be able to outrun him. So uh, uh, you tell me now. And so I kept waiting. And um, she said, Billy, I would love to do that. She said, I love you. God bless her soul now. She's in glory. She said, I love you. Said, I think we ought to tell our par the parents about it. Don't you think so? And I said, honey, listen, let's start this out with a 50-50 proposition. <laughs> I said, I'll tell your daddy if you'll tell your mother. <laughs> Rooting the worst part off on her to begin with. She said, all right, if you'll tell daddy first. I said, all right, I'll tell him Sunday night. And so Sunday night come, I... Uh, Brought her home from church, and I, she kept looking at me, and I looked, it's 9.30, it's time for me to get going, so Charlie was sitting at his desk, typing away, and Miss Brombeck sat over the corner doing some kind of a crocheting, you know, or them little hooks she put over the things, you know, I don't know what you call it. And so she was doing some of that kind of stuff, and Hope kept looking at me, she'd frown at me, you know, motion to her daddy, and I, oh my, I thought, what if he says No. So I started out to the door. I said, well, I guess I better go. And I walked to the door, and, and uh, she started over at the door with me. She'd always come to the door and tell me good night. So I started at the door, and she said, aren't you going to tell him? And I said, huh. I said I'm sure trying to, but I, I, I don't know how I'm going to go to do it. And she said, I'll just go back, and you call him out. So she walked back and left me standing there. And I said, uh, Charlie... 
He turned around and said, Yeah, Bill. I said, uh, <clears throat> Could I talk to you just a minute? He said, Sure. He turned around from his desk. Miss Brumback looked at him, looked toward Hope, looked at me. I said, uh, Would you come out on the porch? <laughs> he said, Yes, I'll come out. So he walked out on the porch. I said, Sure is a pretty night, isn't it? <laughs> he said, Yes, it is. I said, Sure been warm. Certainly has. He looked at me. And I said, I've been working so hard. I said, you know, even my hands is getting callous. He said, you can have her, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. You can have her. I thought, oh, that's better. I said, you really mean it, Charlie? He said, I said, Charlie, look. I know it. She's your daughter, and you got money, and he reached over and got me by the hand. He said, Bill, listen, money ain't all things that's in human life. He said, I said, Charlie, I only make 20 cents an hour, but I love her. She loves me. I promise you, Charlie, that I'll work till these, the calluses wear off of my hands to make her a living. I'll be just as true to her as I could be. He said, I believe that, Bill. He said, listen, Bill, I want to tell you. He said, you know, happiness don't altogether take money to be happy. He said, just be good to her, and I know you will. I said, thank you, Charlie. I sure will do that. And it's her time to tell Mama. <laughs> I don't know how she got by, but we got married. <laughs> so when we got married, we didn't have nothing. Nothing go housekeeping. I think we had two or three dollars. So we rented a house. It cost us four dollars a month. It was a little old two-room place. And someone gave us an old folding bed. I wonder if anybody ever seen an old folding bed. And they gave us that. And I went out to Sears and Roebucks and got a little uh, table with four chairs. And it, uh, it wasn't painted, you know. And we got that on time. And so then I went over to Mr. Weber, a junk dealer, and bought a cooking stove. I paid 75 cents for it and a dollar and something for grates to go in it. We set up housekeeping. I remember taking and painting a shamrock on the chairs when I painted them. And, oh, we were happy. We had one another, so that was all necessary. God, by His mercy and His goodness, was the happiest little couple could be on the earth. I found this, that happiness does not consist of how much of the world's good you own, but how contented you are with the potion that's allotted to you. And after a while, God came down and blessed our little home. We had a little boy. His name is Billy Paul. He's in the service right now here. And uh, a little later from that, about 11 months, he blessed us again with a little girl called Sharon Rose, taken from the word of the Rose of Sharon. And I remember one day I had saved up my money and I was going to take a little vacation, going up to a place, uh, Papa Lake, to fish. And on my road back and during this time, I'm leaving out my conversion. I was converted and was ordained by Dr. Roy Davis in the Missionary Baptist Church and had become a minister and have the tabernacle that I now preach in in Jeffersonville. And uh, I was pastoring the little church and I, no money, I pastored the church 17 years and never got one penny. I didn't believe in take. There wasn't even an offering plate in it. And what tithings I had from work and so forth, I had a little box on the back of the building said, little sign on it, in so much as you have done unto the least of these, my little ones, you have did it unto me. And then that's how the church was paid for. We had 10 years uh, loan to pay it and was paid off less than two years. And I never took an offering of no kind. And then I had a few dollars I saved up for my vacation. She worked too at Fine Shirt Factory, a lovely darling girl. And uh, her grave is probably snowy today, but she's still in my heart. And I remember when she worked so hard to help me to have enough money to go up to this lake to fish. And when I was coming back from the lake, I began to see coming into Mishawaka in South Bend, Indiana. 
And I began to notice cars that had signs on the back that said, Jesus only. And I thought, that sounds strange, Jesus only. And I began noticing those signs and his own anywhere from bicycles, Fords, Cadillacs, and what more. Jesus only. And I followed some of them down and they come to a great big church and I found out they were Pentecostal. I'd heard of Pentecostal, but they were a bunch of holy rollers. They laid on the floor and frothed at their mouth and everything that they told me about. So I didn't want nothing to do with it. So I heard them all carrying on in there and I thought, believe I'll just walk in. So I stopped my old Ford and walked in and all the singing you ever heard in your life. And I come to find out there were two great churches, one of them called the PA of J.C., and the PA of W. Many of you people might remember those old organ. I think they're United called now called the United Pentecostal Church. Well, I listened to some of their teachers. They were standing there. All oh, they were teaching about Jesus and how great He was and how great the, uh, everything was, and about a baptism of the Holy Ghost. I thought, what are they talking about? And after a while, somebody jumped up and started speaking with tongues. Well, I never heard anything like that in my life. And here comes some woman up through there running just as hard as she could. Then all of them got up and started running. And I thought, well, brother, they sure ain't got no church manners. Screaming and shouting and carrying on. I thought, what a bunch this is. But you know, something about it, longer I sit there, the better I liked it. <laughs> there was something seemed to be real good. And I began to watch them, and it went on. I thought, I'll just bear with them a while, because I'm close to the door. If anything starts just rational, I'll run out the door. I know where my car is parked, just around the corner. And I began to hear some of them preachers as scholars and students. Well, I thought, that's fine. So it comes supper time, and said, everybody come to supper. But I thought, wait a minute. I got a dollar and 75 cents to go home. And I, that's all I had for gasoline money, just taking that to take me home. And I had my old Ford. It was a pretty good old Ford. It wasn't backslid. It's just like this and out here. It just wore out. And it, I actually believe that Ford would go 30 miles an hour. But, of course, that was 15 this way and 15 this way, you see. Put it together, you had 30. And so it, um, I thought, well, that night I think I would go out. And after the, I stayed for the night service, and all, he said, all of the preachers, regardless of denomination, come to the platform. Well, there's about 200 of us up there. I went up, and so he said, now we haven't got time for you all to preach. He said, just walk by and say who you are and where you're from. Well, it come my time, I said, William Branham, Baptist, Jeffersonville, Indiana. Walk by. I hear all the rest of them calling themselves Pentecostal, 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 PFW, PHAC, PAW, PAW. I walked by, I thought, well, I guess I'm the ugly duckling, so I sit down, waited. And that day they had fine young preachers out there, and they'd preached powerfully. And then they said, the ones going to bring the message tonight is, I believe they called them elder. And the ministers, instead of reverend, it was elder. And they brought an old colored man out there. And he had one of these old-fashioned preacher's coats. I don't guess you've ever seen one. Long pigeon tail in the back, you know, with a velvet collar, and he had just a little white rim of hair around his head. Poor old fellow, he came out like this, you know, and he stood there and he turned around. And where all the preachers had been preaching about Jesus and the great, how great he was and so forth, that old man took his text from over in Job. Where was you when I laid the foundation of the world? Or when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. And that poor old fellow, I thought, why did you put some of them young fellows up there to preach? Great, the place is packed and jammed. And I thought, why didn't they do that? So then uh, this old fella, instead of preaching what was going on down here on earth, he began to preach what was going on in heaven all the time. Well, he took him up at the beginning, at the beginning of time and brought him back in the second coming down the horizontal rainbow. I, I never heard such preaching in my life. About that time the Spirit hit him, he jumped about that high and clicked his heels together, sold his shoulders back and went tipping off that platform, said, you haven't got room enough up here for me to preach. And he had more room than I got here. I thought, if that'll make an old man act like that, what would he do if he got on me? I, I know, I, maybe I need some of that. Well, he come out there, I felt so sorry for the old fellow, but when he left, I was feeling sorry for myself. And I looked at him go off there. I went out that night, and I thought, now the next morning, I'm not going to let nobody know who, who I am. So I went. 
And that night I pressed my trousers. I took, uh, went out in the cornfield to sleep, and I went out and bought me some stale rolls. I bought a whole bunch of them for a nickel. There's a hydrant down there. I got some water, so I know that would last me a little while. So I got me some water and drank it and went and eat my rolls and come back and got another drink of water and went out in the cornfield, tucked the two seats and laid my little seersucker trousers in there, pressed them on the seat. And that night I prayed pretty near all night. I said, Lord, what is this I got into? i never seen such religious people in my life. And I said, help me to know what this is all about. And the next morning, I got down there and invited us for breakfast. Of course, I wouldn't come eat with them because I had nothing to put in the offering. And I just went back. And the next morning, when I went in, my, I ate some of my rolls and sat down. And there's got on a microphone, and I'd never seen a microphone before. And I was scared of that thing. So they and I had a little string hanging up here and hanging down one of drop mics like. And he said, last night on the platform... There was a young preacher here, a Baptist. I thought, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm good for working over now. And it said, um, he was the youngest preacher on the platform. His name was Branham. Does anybody know any whereabouts of him? Tell him to come on. We want him to bring the morning message. Oh, my. I had a little T-shirt on and seersucker trousers, you know. And we Baptists believe you had to have a suit on to get in the pulpit, you know. So... And I, I just sat real still. And during the time, they had it up in the north then, because their international convention, the colored people couldn't come to it in the south. They had the colored there, and I was a southerner. Had starch in my collar yet, you see. Thought I was a little better than somebody else. And it happened to be that morning, sit right down by me was a, a colored man. So I sat and looked up at him. I thought, well, he's a brother. And he said, anybody know the whereabouts of William Branham? I hooked down the seat. <laughs> so he said, announced it the second time. Said, anybody on the outside, he pulled his little mic in, know the whereabouts of William Branham. Tell him we want him on the platform for the morning message. He's a Baptist preacher from southern Indiana. I just sat real still and ducked down. You know, nobody knew me anyhow. That colored boy looked over at me and said, you know where he is? <laughs> I like I either had to lie or do something. So I said, hold down here. He said, yes, sir. I said, I want to tell you something. I said, uh, I'm him. He said, well, go on up there. And I said, oh, I can't. See, I said, I got on these little old seersucker trousers, this little T-shirt. I said, I couldn't go up there. He said, damn people don't care how you dress. Go on up there. I said, no, no. I said, keep still. Don't say nothing now. And then he come back to the phone and said, Anybody know the whereabouts of William Branham? He said, here he is. Here he is. <laughs> here he is. Oh, my. There I got up with that little T-shirt on, you know, and here I... He said, come on up, Mr. Branham. We want you to bring the message. Oh, my. For all them preachers. Mm, all them people. And I went slipping up, you know, my face red and my ears burning. and I slipped up... Seer sucker trousers, t shirts, preacher, Baptist preacher going up to the microphone, never seen one before. You see. I stood up there, I said, Well, uh, I don't know about this. <laughs> I was fumbling real nervous, you know, and, and I got over here around Luke 16, and I thought, Where on I? And I, I got on the subject, and he lifted up his eyes in hell and cried. Now I got. <laughs> so I, I began to preach, you know, and I got to preach, and it felt a little better, and I said, the rich man was in hell, and he cried. That little three words, like I have a lot of sermons like that. Believe us out of this and speak to the rock. You've heard me preach, Sam. And, I had, and then he cried. And I said, there's no children there. Certainly not in hell. Then he cried. I said, there's no flowers there. Then he cried. There's no God there. Then he cried. There's no Christ there. Then he cried. Then I cried. <laughs> Something got a hold of me. My, oh, my. I don't know what happened. Well, now I kind of got to myself, I stand on the outside. Then people got screaming and shouting and crying, and I, we had an awful time. When I come outside, there's a fellow walked up to me with a great big Texas hat on, big boots. Walked up said, I'm Elder so-and-so, preacher. Cowboy boots, cowboy clothes on. I thought, well, my seer sucker trousers ain't so bad then. So I want you to come down to Texas and hold me a revival. Mm, let me put that down, mister. I put it down like that. Here come a fellow up with one of these little kind of a golf trousers on where he used to play golf. You know, they had them little blouse pants. He said, I'm Elder so-and-so from Miami. I'd like to... 
My, maybe dressing isn't so much of it. I looked at it and thought, all right. So I grabbed these things and home I went. Wife met me and she said, why you sound so happy about Billy? I said, oh, I met the cream of the crop. My, it's the best you've ever seen. Them people ain't ashamed of their religion and oh, I told her all about it. I said, and looky here, honey, a whole string of invitations. Them people. He said, they're not holy rollers, are they? I said, I don't know what kind of rollers they are, but they got something that I needed. See, I said, that, that's one thing, I'm sure. I said, oh, I've seen an old man 90 years old come young again. I said, I never heard such preaching in my life. Why, I never seen a Baptist preach like that. I said, they preach till they get out of breath and bend their knees, plumb to the floor and come back up, catch their breath. You can hear them two blocks away still preaching. And I said, I, I never heard such in my life. And I said, they speak in an unknown tongue and the other one tells what they're talking about. Never heard such in my life. I said, will you go with me? She said, honey, when I married you, I would stick with you until death shall separate us. She said, I'll go. She said, I will tell the folks... And I said, well, you tell your mama and I'll tell my mama. So we, I went and told mama. Mama said, well, sure, Billy. Whatever the Lord's called you to do, go do. And so Miss Brumback asked for me to come up. Well, she said, what's this you're talking about? And I said, oh, Miss Brumback. I said, you ought to have seen such people. She said, quieten down, quieten down. I said, yes, ma'am. I said, I'm sorry. And uh, she said, do you know that's a bunch of holy rollers? I said, no, ma'am, I didn't know that. I said, they, they sure are fine people. She said, the very idea, do you think you'd drag my daughter out amongst stuff like that? I said, ridiculous, that's nothing but trash that the other churches have thrown out. She said, indeed, you'll not drag my daughter out like that. I said, but, you know, Miss Brumback, down in my heart, I feel that the Lord wants me to go with them people. She said, you go back up to your church until they're able to afford a parsonage for you and act like a man's got some sense. I said, you're not taking my daughter out through there. I said, yes, ma'am. I turned around, walked out, and Hope started crying. She came out, she said, Billy, regardless of what Mama says, I'll stay with you. Bless her heart. And I said, oh, that's all right, honey. Now I just... Let it go. She wouldn't let her daughter go with such people as that because it wasn't nothing but trash. And so I just kind of let it go. It was the worst mistake I ever made in my life. One of the worst. A little later, a few years after the children come, and one day we was... They come up a flood in 1937. There came a flood. And our I was on patrol at that time, and... I was trying my best to bring the people out of the flood houses, tearing down, and my own wife took sick, and she was real, real sick with pneumonia. And they took her out the regular hospital so full we couldn't put her in there, so we taken her out to the, the government where they had a room out there. And so then they called me back out, and I always lived on the river and quite a boatman, so I was trying to get the people rescue them from the flood. And then I... One, they called me said, there's a house over on Chestnut Street. It's about ready to go in. There's a mother and a bunch of children in there. I said, if you think your boat, your motor can get into them. I said, well, I'll do all I can. And I was shooting those waves. A dike had broke up there. And oh, my, they were just washing the city out. And I would give it all the juice that I could. And finally down across the alleys and through the places. And I got there close to where the old levee was. The water pouring through, and I heard someone scream, and I seen a mother stand out on the porch, and there's them big rollers going through like that. Well, I went on up this way as far as I could and hit the stream and come back and got on that side. I got my boat stopped just in time to tie it around the pillar of the post of the door, post or porch post, and I run in and grabbed the mother and got her in there, two or three of the children, and I undone my boat and got her to back come out way down below and got her over to the shore about a mile and a half across the city. So I got her to the shore and then when I got over there, she fainted and she began, she was screaming, my baby, my baby. Well, I thought that she meant she left the baby in the house. Ooh, my, I tucked back again while they were trying to take care of her and I come to find out it was, she was wanting to know where her baby was there. There was a little fellow about three years old and I thought she meant a little nursing baby or something. And so I took back and got over there, and when I got that boat and got on the inside and couldn't find old baby, and the porch gave away, and the house went in. And I run real quick and grabbed the, the piece there that was floating my boat, got into the boat and pulled that and loosened it up, and it done got me out into the current of the main river then, 
and it was about 11.30 at night, and it's sleeting and snowing, and I grabbed a hold of the starter string, and I tried to pull the boat, and it wouldn't start, and I tried, and it wouldn't start, and I tried again, getting farther in that current, the falls just below me. And I was trying real hard, and I thought, oh my, here, here's my end, this is it. And I'd try real hard, and I said, Lord, please don't let me die a death like this. And I'd pull, and I'd pull, and it'd come back to me. What about that bunch of trash that you wouldn't go to? Huh? I put my hand back on the boat, and I said, God, be merciful to me. Don't let me leave my wife and baby like this. And them out there sick, please. And I just kept pulling like that, and it wouldn't start. And I could hear the roaring down there, because I just a few minutes, and oh my, that would be it. And I said, Lord, if you'll forgive me, I promise you I'll do anything. And kneeling in that boat there in the sleet hit me in the face. I said, I'll do anything that you want me to do. And I pulled again and it started. And I turned all the gas on it I could and finally got into the shore and I went back to find the truck, patrol truck. And I thought, of, they, some of them said, say, the government just washed away. My wife and baby in there. Both babies. And I tuck out for the government as hard as I could, and the water was standing about 15 feet deep all through it. And there was a major there, and I said, Major, what happened to the hospital? He said, Now, don't be worried. Do you have anyone in there? I said, Yes, a, a sick wife and two babies. He said, They all got out. He said, They're in a freight car, and they've headed towards Charleston. I run, got my boat, and I uh, got my car and my boat in the back of it, and run out there to, and then the creeks had come down about two and a half or three miles wide. All night long, I tried to, some of them said the car, the freight car washed off the tracks out there on the trestle. Well, find myself marooned out on a little island, sat there three days. I had plenty of time to think about whether that was trash or not. This beating, where's my wife? Finally, when I found her, and a few days after I got out and got across, she was way up to Columbus, Indiana, in the Baptist auditorium where they'd made a a hospital-like uh, sick rooms on little government cots. And I ran to her as hard as I could, trying to find where she was, screaming, hope, hope, hope. And I looked, and there she was laying on a cot, and TB had set in. She raised her little bony hand, and she said, Billy. And I run to her, and I said, hope, honey. She said, I look awful, don't I? I said, no, honey, you look all right. For about six months, we worked with everything that was in us to try to get to save her life, but she kept getting lower and lower. One day I was on patrol and I had my radio turned on and I thought, I heard him say, make a call on the radio, said, for William Branham wanted the hospital at once, wife dying. I rushed back to the hospital as quick as I could, turned on the red light and the siren and took off. And then I, I got up at the hospital and I stopped running, coming down to the, the hospital. I seen a little buddy of mine that we fished together. We run together as boys. Sam Adair, Dr. Sam Adair, he's the one that was the vision come not long ago and told him about the clinic. He said, if anybody doubted the vision, just call him collect if you want to know about whether it was right or not. And so then here he come out like that and he had his hat in his hand. He looked at me and he just started crying. And I run up to him, throw my arms around him, he put his arms around me, he said, Billy, she's going. He said, I'm sorry, I've done all I could do, I've had specialists and everything. I said, Sam, surely she's not going. He said, yep, she's going. And he said, don't go in there, Bill. And I said, I've got to go in, Sam. He said, don't do it, don't, please don't. I said, let me go in. He said, I'll go with you. I said, no, you stay out here. I want to stay with her in her last minute. He said, she's unconscious. I walked in the room and the nurse was sitting there and she was crying because she and Hope was schoolmates together. And so I looked over and she started crying, put her hand up and started walking over. And I looked over and shook her. There she was. She had went down from about 120 pounds to about 60. And I, I shook her. And if I live uh, to be 100 years old, I'll never forget what happened. She turned over and those great, big, pretty eyes looked up at me. She smiled. She said, why did you call me back, Billy? I said, honey, I just got the cash. I had to work. We was way in debt and hundreds of dollars a doctor bill and nothing to pay it with. And I just had to work. And I've seen her two or three times a day. 
And every night, and then when she was in that condition, I said, what do you mean call you back? She said, Bill, you've preached about it, you've talked about it, but you don't have no idea what it is. I said, what are you talking about? She said, heaven. She said, look, she said, I was being escorted home by some people's man or women or something that was dressed in white. And she said, I was at ease and peace. She said, big, pretty birds flying from tree to tree. She said, don't think I'm beside myself. She said, Billy, I'm going to tell you our mistake. She said, sit down. I didn't. I knelt down, took her hand. She said, you know where our mistake is? And I said, yes, sweetheart, I do. She said, we should have never listened to Mama. Them people were right. I said, I know it. She said, promise me this, that you'll go to those people. I said, because they're right. And she said, raise my children like that. And I said, she said, I want to tell you something. She said, I'm dying. I said, it's, I, don't, I don't dread going. I said, it's, it's beautiful. She said, the only thing I hate to leave you, Bill... And I know you've got these two little children to raise. She said, promise me that, that you'll not stay single and let my children be pulled about from pillar to post. That's a sensible thing for a 21-year-old mother. And I said, I can't promise that hope. She said, please promise me. said, one thing I want to tell you. said, you remember that rifle? I'm just crazy about guns. And she said, you wanted to buy that rifle that day and you didn't have enough money to make the down payment? I said, yes. She said, I've been saving my money, my nickels, to try to make that down payment on that rifle for you. She said, now, when this is over and you go back home, look up on the duofold, or the folding bed, under that piece of paper on top, and you'll find the money there. She said, promise me that you'll buy that rifle. You don't know how I felt when I seen that $1.75 in nickels laying there. I got the rifle. And she said, you remember that time that you were going downtown to buy me a pair of stockings? And we was going to Fort Wayne. I said, yes. I'd come in from fishing. And she said, we had to go to Fort Wayne. I had to preach that night. And she said, uh, uh, you know, I told you, there's two different kinds. One called chiffon and what's the other? Ray, rayon, is that right? Rayon and chiffon. Well, ever which is, uh, chiffon was the best, is that right? And uh, she said, now you get me some chiffon, the full style. You know, that thing, it's got that little thing in the back of the stock. And, top. and I didn't know nothing about women's clothes. So I, and I was going down the street and saying, chiffon, 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 trying to keep thinking of chiffon, chiffon, chiffon. Somebody said, hello, Billy. And I said, hello, 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 chiffon, 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 chiffon. And I got the corner and I met Mr. Spawn. He said, hey, Billy, you know the perch is biting out over on the side of that last pier? I said, sure enough. Is that right? Yeah. I thought, now when I left him, what was that stuff? I forgot it. So Thelma Ford, a girl that I knew, worked at the 10 cent store, and I know they sell women's uh, stockings over there. So I went over, I said, hi, Thelma. And she said, hi, Billy. How are you? How's Hope? And I said, fine. I said, Thelma, I want a pair of socks for Hope. She said, Hope don't want socks. I said, yes, ma'am, she sure does. I said, you mean stockings. Oh, so that's, that's what it is. I thought, oh, oh don't show me ignorance. And she said, what kind does she want? I thought, oh. I said, what kind you got? <laughs> she said, well, we got rayon. I didn't know the difference. Rayon, chiffon, all sound the same. I said, that's what I want. She said, uh, I said, fix me a pair of them, full style. And she, or, uh, I got that wrong. What is it? Full fashion, full fashion. And uh, so I said, uh, uh, fix me a pair of them. And when she went to give them to me, there's only about 30 cents. 20 cents or 30 cents, about half price. Well, I said, give me two pair of them. See? And I went back home and I said, you know, honey, you women shop all over town to find bargains. You know how you like to crow. And I said, but here, look here, I bought two pair for the price that you buy one pair with. See? I said, oh, that's, that's my personal ability. See, I said, I said, you know, Thelma sold me these. I said, she might let me have them at half price. She said, did you get chiffon? I said, yes, ma'am. It all sounded the same to me. I didn't know there was any different. And she told me, she said, Billy, I thought strange when she got to Fort Wayne, she had to get another pair of stockings. She said, I give them to your mother. Said, they're for older women. Said, I'm sorry I did that. I said, oh, that's all right, honey. And she said, now, don't, don't live single. 
And she said, she didn't know that what was fixing to happen in a few hours from then. And I held her darling hands while the angels of God packed her away. I went home. I didn't know what to do. I laid down there at night and, and I heard, I think a little mouse was in the old grate where we had some papers in there and I shut the door with my foot in there hung her kimono on the back and laying down there in the morgue. And just in a little bit, someone called me said, Billy, this Brother Frank Broy said, your baby's dying. I said, my baby? He said, yes, Sharon Rose. I said, Doc's up there now and said, she's got tubercular meningitis. She nursed it from her mother and said, she's dying. I got in the car, went up there and there she was, a sweet little thing. And they rushed her to the hospital. I went out to see him. Sam come up and said, Billy, don't you go in that room. You got to think of Billy Paul. I said, she's dying. I said, Doc, I, I got to see my baby. He said, no, you can't go in. said, she's got meningitis, Billy. And you'd pack it to Billy Paul. And I waited till he got out. I couldn't stand to see her daughter and mother laying down there in the undertaker's establishment. I tell you, the way of a transgressor is hard. And I, I went, slipped in the door, and when Sam went out, the nurse went out, I went out into the basement. It's a little bitty hospital. She's in an isolated place, and the flies was in her little eyes. They had a little, what we call a mosquito bar, a little netting over her eyes. And she was a little spasm. Her little fat leg was moving up and down like that, and her little hands with that spasm. And I looked at her, and she's just big enough to be cute, about eight months old. And her mother used to set her out there with her little three corners on, you know, in the yard when I'd come up and I'd toot the horn, and she'd go, goo, 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 reaching for me, you know. There laid my darling die. I looked down to her and I said, Sherry, you know Daddy? You know Daddy, Sherry? And when she looked, she was suffering so hard that one of them pretty little blue eyes had crossed. It like to tore my heart out of me. I knelt down and I said, Lord, what have I done? Have not I preached the gospel on the street corners? I've done everything that I know to do. Don't hold it against me. I never call them people trash. It was her that called them people trash. I said, I'm sorry it all happened. Forgive me. Don't, don't take my baby. And while I was praying, it looked like a black, like a sheet or cloth come down. I know he had refused me. Now, there was the hardest and the most treacherous time of my life. When I raised up and looked at her, and I thought, Satan put in my mind, well, you mean as hard as you've preached in the way that you've lived, and now when it comes to your own baby, he'll turn you down. I said, that's right. If he can't save my baby, then I can't I stop. I... I just didn't know what to do. And then I said this. I said, Lord, you gave her to me and you took in her away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you take it, even me, I'll still love you. And I put my hand over on her and I said, bless you, sweetheart. Daddy wanted to raise you with all my heart. I wanted to raise you and raise you to love the Lord. But the angels are coming for you, sweetheart. Daddy will take your little body down and lay it on the arms of Mama. I'll bury you with her. Someday, Daddy will meet you. You just wait up there with Mama. When her mother was dying, she said, last word she said, she said, Bill, stay on the field. I said, I'll, she said, I said, if I'm on the field, when he comes, I'll get the kids and meet. If I'm not, I'll be buried by you. And you go over on the right-hand side of the great gate and when you see all of them come in stand there and start hollering Bill, Bill, Bill just as loud as you can I'll meet you there I kissed her goodbye I'm on the battlefield today that's been nearly 20 years ago I got my date with my wife I'm going to meet her I took the little baby when it died and put it on the arms of the mother and we taken it out to the cemetery and I stood there to hear Brother Smith the Methodist preacher that preached the funeral 
ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And I thought, heart to heart. There she went. Not long after that, I took little Billy there one morning. He's just a little bitty feller. He was, that's the reason he sticks with me and I stick with him. I had to be both Papa and Mama both to him. I'd take his little bottle. And we couldn't afford to have a fire at night to keep his milk warm. And I'd lay it under my back like this and keep it warm by the heat of my body. We've stuck together like buddies. And one of these days when I go off the field, I want to hand him the word and say, Go on, Billy. You stay with it. Some people wonder why I got him with me all the time. I can't give him up. He's even married, but I still remember she told me to stay with him. We stuck together like buddies. Remember walking around town, the bottle under my arm. He get to crying one night. He was was walking out in the backyard where just when she was fixing to have him, she was smothering. I just a girl, you know, and I'd walk back and forth from the old oak tree in the back of the yard. And he was crying for his mama. And I didn't have any mama to take him to. And I packed him. I said, "Oh, honey," and I said. He said, "Daddy, where's my mama?" Did you put her into that ground? I said, no, honey, she's ours. She's up in heaven. And he said something there like to kill me one afternoon. He was crying. I had his long late in the evening. And I was packing him on my back, uh, packing him on my shoulder, and patting him like this. He said, Daddy, please go get Mama and bring her here. And I said, honey, I can't get Mama. Jesus said, well, tell Jesus to send me my Mama. I want her. I said, well, honey, I... I mean you go go see her sometime. And he stopped and said, Daddy. And I said, Yeah. I said, I see Mama up there on that cloud. Uh, like to kill me. I thought, Ma, I see Mama up there on that cloud. I just almost fainted. I hugged the little fella up to my bosom like that. Just held my head down. Went on in. Days passed. I couldn't forget it. I tried to work couldn't go back home. It wasn't home no more. I wanted to stay. We didn't have nothing but just that old tore up furniture. But it was something that she and I had enjoyed together. It was home. And I remember one day I was trying to work in public service. I went up to fix it. An old secondary was hanging down. It was real early in the morning. And I climbed up this cross and I couldn't give that baby up. I could see my wife going, but that baby going, just a little bitty thing. And I... I was on there and I was singing, On the hill far away stood an old rugged cross and the primaries run down to the transformer and went out in the, you know, secondary. And I was hanging up there on it and I happened to look at the sun coming up behind me and there my hand stretched out and the sign of that cross on the, on the hillside. I thought, yes, it was my sins that put him there. I said, Sharon, honey, Daddy wants to see you so bad, honey. How I'd like to hold you in my arms again, you darling little thing. I got beside myself. It had been weeks. I pulled off my rubber glove. There's 2,300 volts running right by the side of me. I pulled off my rubber glove. I said, God, I hate to do this. I'm a coward. But Cherry, Daddy's going to see you and Mommy just in a few minutes. Started pulling off my glove to put my hand on that 2,300. Break. Why do you even have no blood left in you? So I, I, I started pulling that glove off and something happened. When I come to, I was sitting on the ground with my hands up like this to my face crying. It was God's grace or I wouldn't have been having a healing service here. I'm sure of that. It was Him protecting His gift, not me. I started home. I quit. Put my tools away and went back. I said, I'm going home. I started around the house and I picked up the mail in the house. kind of cold and... I went in, we had one little room, I was sleeping on a little cot there, and the frost coming up, and that old stove, I took the mail, and I looked in the mail, and the first thing on there was her little Christmas saving, 80 cents, Miss Sharon Rose Branham. There it was all over again. I'd been game warden. I reached in there and got my gun, pistol, out from the holster. I said, Lord, I, I can't go this anymore. I'm, I'm dying. I'm, I'm so tormented. I pulled a hammer back on the gun, put it up to my head, kneeling there on that cot in that dark room. I said, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thine will be done. And as I tried, I squeezed that trigger as hard as I could. I said, on earth as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And it wouldn't go off. I thought, oh God, are you just tearing me to pieces? What have I done? You won't even let me die. And I throwed the gun down and went off and shot through the room. I said, God, why can't I die and get out of it? I just can't go no farther. You've got to do something to me. And I fell over and started crying on my little old dirty bunk there. And I must have went to sleep. I don't know whether it was asleep or what happened. I've always longed to be out west. I've always wanted one of them hats. My father broke horses in his young days, and I always wanted one of them hats. And Brother Demas Sakarin bought me one yesterday. First one I've had and ever had it like that. One of them kind of western hats. And I thought I was going down along through the prairie, singing that song. There's a wheel on the wagon, it's broken. Sign on the ranch for sale. As it went along, I noticed an old covered wagon, like a little prairie schooner, and the wheel was broke. Of course, that represented my broken family. And as I got close, I looked and there stood a, a real pretty young girl, about 20 years old, white flowing hair and blue eyes, dressed in white. I looked over at her, I said, how do you do? Went on, she said, hello, Dad. And I turned back and I said, Dad? Well, I said, how, miss, can you, can I be your daddy when you're as old as I am? She said, Daddy, you just don't know where you're at. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, this is heaven. I said, on earth, I was your little Sharon. Well, I said, honey, you was just a little baby. I said, Daddy, little babies are not little babies. Here, they're immortal. They never get old or never grow. And I said... Oh, Sharon, honey, you, you're a pretty young woman. She said, Mama's waiting for you. I said, where? She said, up at your new home. I said, new home? Branhams are vagabonds. They don't have homes. They just... And I said, well, I never had a home, honey. She said, but you got one up here, Daddy. I don't mean to be a baby. But it's just so real to me. As I start to thinking of it, it, it all comes back again. She said, you got one here, Daddy. I know I got one over there. Someday I'll go to it. She said, where's Billy Paul, my brother? I said, well, I left him at Miss Broy's just a few minutes ago. said, Mother wants to see you. And I turned and looked. And there was great big palaces and the glory of God coming up around him and I heard an angelic choir singing my home sweet home I started up a long steps running just as hard as I could and when I got to the door there she stood a white garment on that black hair long holding down her back she raised out her arms as she always did when I come home tired from work or something I caught her by the hands of I said, honey, I seen Sharon down there. I said, she made a pretty girl, didn't she? She said, yes, Bill. She said, Bill, put her arms around me. And she said, just around my shoulders. She started patting me. She said, stop worrying about me and Sharon. I said, honey, I can't help it. She said, now, Sharon and I are better off than you are. And said, don't worry about us no more. Will you promise me? And I said, I hope. I said, I've been so lonesome for you. And for Sharon and Billy cries all the time for you. I said, I don't know what to do with him. And she said, it'll be all right, Bill. She said, just promise me you won't weary no more. And she said, won't you sit down? And I looked around and there's a great big chair. And I remember... I tried to buy a chair. Now, in closing, I tried to buy a chair one time. We just had them old old common wooden bottom chairs for that breakfast set. We had to use them, the old chairs we had. And we could buy one of these chairs that let back in the back like a, a, 
I forget what kind of easy rest chair. And it cost $17. You could pay $3 down and a dollar a week. And we got one. And oh, when I come in, I'd work all day and preach till midnight around the streets and wherever I could preach. And, and I, one day I got behind on my payments. We couldn't make it. And it got day after day. And finally, one day they come and got my chair. And tuck it. That night, I never will forget, she had me a cherry pie baked, poor little old thing. She, she, she knew I was going to be disappointed. And after supper, I said, what you so good about tonight, honey? And she said, say, I had the boys over in the neighborhood to dig you some fishing worms. Don't you think we ought to go down to the river and fish a little while? And I said, yes, but... And she started crying. I know there was something wrong. I had an idea, because it already sent me a notice it's coming to get it. We couldn't make that dollar payment a week. We couldn't, we couldn't afford it. She put her arms around me, and I went to the door, and my chair was gone. She told me up there, she said, You remember that chair, Bill? And I said, Yes, honey, I remember. She said, That's what she's thinking about, wasn't it? Yeah. She said, Well, they won't take this one. This one's paid for. She said, Sit down just a minute. I want to talk to you. I said, Honey, I don't understand this. And she said, promise me, Billy, promise me that you won't worry anymore. You're going back now. I said, promise me you won't worry. And I said, I can't do that. Whole... And just then I come to. It was dark in the room. I looked around and I felt her arm around me. I said, oh, Oprah, are you here in the room? She started patting me. She said, you go make me that promise, Bill? Promise me you won't marry worry no more? I said, I promise you. And when then she patted me two or three times, and she was gone. I jumped up and turned on the light, looked everywhere. She was gone. But she's just gone out of the room. She isn't gone. She's still living. She was a Christian. Billy and I went to the grave here some time ago, packing a little flower for his mother and sister, just on an Easter morning, and we stopped. The little fellow started crying. He said, Daddy, my mom is down there. I said, No, honey, no, she ain't down there. Sister ain't down there. We got a folded over grave here, but way across the sea there's an open grave where Jesus rose, and someday he'll come, he'll bring sister and mama with him. I'm on the battlefield today, friends. I, I just can't tell anymore. I, God bless you. Let's bow our heads a minute. Oh, Lord. Many times, Lord, I'm sure people don't understand when they think these things come easy. But there's a great day coming when Jesus shall come and all these sorrows will be wiped away. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you help us to be prepared. And that last promise when I kissed her on the cheek that morning and I'd meet her there that day, I believe she'll be standing at that post screaming my name. I've lived true to that promise since, Lord. Around the world, in all kinds of places, trying to bring the gospel. Getting old now, tired of war out. One of these days, I'm going to close this Bible for the last time. God, keep me faithful to the promise. Keep your grace around me, Lord. I may not look at the things of this life, but live for the things that's beyond. Help me to be honest. I don't ask for a flower bed of ease. No, Lord, when my Christ died there under suffering, and all the rest of them died like that, I don't ask for any easy thing. Just let me be honest, Lord, truthful. Let people love me so I can lead them to Thee. 
someday when it's all over and we gather around her in the evergreen trees, I want to get her by the hand and walk her up to the show the people of Angela's Temple and all the others. It'll be a great time, man. I pray that your mercies rest upon each of us here. And those who are here, Lord, may not even know you. And maybe they've got some little loved one across the sea yonder. If they've never fulfilled their promise, may they do it now, Lord. While we have our heads bowed, I wonder in this great huge auditorium this afternoon, how many of you say, Brother Branham, I want to meet my loved ones too. I, I've got some loved ones just across the river yonder. Maybe you made a promise that you'd meet them. Maybe when you told mother goodbye up there at the grave that day. Maybe when you told little sister goodbye or dad or some of them at the grave. Promise you'd meet them and you've never made that preparation yet. Don't you think it's a good time now to do it? Excuse my breaking down, but oh my, you don't realize, friend. You don't know what, what sacrifice. That's not a spot, Harley, of the life story. How many of you would like to raise up now and walk up here for prayer? Say, I want to meet my loved ones. Raise up out of the audience and come down here. Will you do it if somebody has never made that preparation yet? God bless you, sir. I see an aged colored man coming out. Others coming. Move yourself. You in the balconies up there, just move right out into the aisle or stand up. You who wants to be remembered in a word of prayer just now that's it stand right up to your feet that's good stand up everywhere you would say i've got a father over yonder i've got a mother or loved one over yonder i want to go see them i want to meet them in peace will you raise up you stand up to your feet anywhere in the audience stand up to your feet say i want to accept god bless you lady god bless you back there bless you up there Lord bless you here, sir, that's right. Up in the balcony, the Lord bless you all around, everywhere. Stand up to your feet now. I have a word of prayer while the Holy Spirit is here. And moving up on our hearts to, de- to break up. You know, what the church needs today is a breaking up. We need to go down to the potter's house. Our stiff, homemade theology sometimes doesn't work so good. What we need is an old-fashioned breaking up. Repentance in our hearts getting mellow towards God. That all now that's ready to stand, let us bow our heads then for prayer. O oh Lord, who brought again Jesus for the de- from the dead to justify all of us by faith believing. I pray, Lord, that these who are standing now to their feet to accept Thee, I pray that forgiveness will be to them. And, oh, Lord, I pray that they will accept You as their Savior and King and lover, and maybe they got a mama, a papa, somebody just across the sea. There's one thing sure, they got a Savior. May they be forgiven of their sins. And all their iniquity blotted out. That their souls may be washed in the blood of the Lamb. And they live in peace from here after. And some glorious day when it's all over, may we gather at your house and be there as unbroken families to meet our loved ones that's waiting on the other side. This we commit them unto thee, that thou will keep him in perfect peace whose heart is stayed upon them. 
Grant it, Lord, as we commit them to Thee. In the name of Thy Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I'm sure the workers see where you're standing. And they will be right with you in a few minutes. And now to those who are going to receive prayer cards. Billy, where's Jean and Leo in the back? They're here to give out the prayer cards. Just in a few minutes, Brother will dismiss the audience in prayer and the prayer cards will be given out. We'll be back here just in a little bit to pray for the sake. All right, Brother.